Welcome to episode 56 of the Sourcing Challenge Show. I'm your host, Mark Lundgren. In this episode, I sat down with Michael Bienko from Berlin in Germany and asked him how he got into sourcing. So uh, actually, as uh, I guess the vast majority of the sourcers, like it started by accident <laughs> uh, because, yeah, like uh, I studied psychology because that was my field of interest. But I didn't know exactly what I want to do after psychology. So I was just crossing out what I don't want to do. And there was kind of a mm, blow off class uh, that I was like, oh, yeah, uh, that's what I'm going to take because it was like HR, uh, psychology and HR, this kind of stuff. And actually, it turned out to be really interesting. And I was like, yeah, OK, OK, yeah, let's try to get an internship in HR. And uh, yeah, I started working. I found an internship which lasted three months and not the, let's just say that um, I wasn't very convinced to sourcing, but also it wasn't like a real sourcing because uh, I was recruiting for like a blue color job. So a <laughs> lot of them come from the organic applies from a, from a general job boards. And I was like, yeah, this is actually, I don't know if that's a, that's a good thing. So I decided like, wait, I need to go to IT. There's where the money are. So uh, I was like, okay, let's give it a try, but uh, another try, but be more focused on mm -hmm. the IT. So I found like a junior IT recruiter slash sourcer job. I didn't know what sourcing is, but it was like, I knew that it was be like looking for candidates, talking to them and sending them clients and like, okay, I'm familiar with this model. Sounds nice. Um, so yeah, then I uh, started to working in my previous company, Humia. Um, and yeah, at the very beginning, like it was, including me, it was four people company. Um, and yeah, and that's what the guys told me that, uh, yeah, basically no organic applies, dude. Like no engineers gonna apply. Uh, you have to source them. Like, do you have a LinkedIn account? And I was like, yes, I do have a LinkedIn account. And like, okay, how many contacts do you have? I'm like, I don't know. What does it matter? Like 20, 30? <laughs> like, what does it matter? And we were, they were like, okay, you're going to need to start, <laughs> start from scratch. And yeah, actually, um, my onboarding was partially um, just training from the guys on the basics of uh, Boolean logic and actually how to um, do a strategic Boolean searches. Mm -hmm. So like, um, if you have 200 results too much, just cut it to like, uh, 50 results, how to do it using only Boolean. Um, and also like kind of an introduction to the technology. Um, and beside that, my onboarding was, okay, Michal, you need to read more about the technology <laughs> because there are a lot of recruiters that I don't know, sending JavaScript developer offered to Java developers and we don't want you to fuck up and we want you to actually understand why the offer might be cool or why it might not be cool and to actually know what you're talking about. Um, and also, here's Boolean Black Belt. <laughs> Read it. It's valuable. And yeah, so actually onboarding was a couple of sessions with the guys and reading. And lo lots of time with Glenn Cathy. Yeah, a lot of time with Glenn Cathy. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Like, and even though like a lot of in that time, like a lot of posts were outdated, um, still like the philosophy and the very basics, like timeless, up to date. And yeah, I still think that's one of the best resources when, when you want to learn uh, sourcing. And, and yeah, and actually like when I started like digging deeper into this, that sourcing is actually kind of a mind teasing game or on how to find people how to identify them and it was yeah it was kind of a mixture of brain teasing and copywriting because you have to write the most the most engaging email uh, in mails on the market and also find emails which was uh, pretty cool um and yeah and i was like damn this is actually quite cool and yeah and I did only, um, I only looked on LinkedIn for some times and like guys told me that there is something like GitHub, but <laughs> I, don't I knew, worry about it. Yeah. They're like, don't worry about it. But, uh, all I knew is that this 
something like a dev, developer's portfolio and you can find email there. I was <laughs> like, cool, that's all I need. Um, but then I learned like um, a little bit more like, okay, so wh- how does GitHub actually work? Like what information does it tell me? Like, um, and yeah, because at some point like LinkedIn wasn't enough and you're looking for different methods to, to source like, uh, yeah, like if I hit the wall on LinkedIn, where should I go? And then you discover like GitHub, Stack Overflow and uh, all these kind of alternative platforms. And also you're learning how to look for different platforms mm-hmm. because you're not going to be looking only for the ver- developers. And yeah, and actually it's kind of a um, two-way learning. Once you read something because you're just curious about this and you want to learn a little bit more, even if you're not going to use it in practice, but just want to read. And second, when you actually need something and you're looking for a specific solution that, um, that you, might, uh, you might find useful in sometimes in unusual places. Uh, so, uh, you ended up in Berlin, uh, and I think uh, similar to a lot of people, what was the, what was the kind of biggest difference from you um, having to recruit well, on the German market and for the German market, uh, specifically in Berlin and tech roles in Berlin? Um, okay, so this is a question that I'm, it's a very good question because I still don't feel confident answering this because <laughs> yeah, like, um, you're learning through different situations and yeah, like, um, like when I started recruiting developers in Poland after like year and a half, I was comfortable with actually being a consultant for a client because before that I had a feeling like, yeah, I don't know market well enough <laughs> and stuff like this. And yeah, I like to experience a lot before I say something with confidence, but um, the, main, the main difference I noticed so far that it's slightly less money driven mm-hmm. uh, for uh, engineering. I mean, like, um, because um, I'm still looking for, a, for an answer, why, why how come? Um, I guess that maybe because like, at least in Berlin, like, pretty much most of people like earn a decent salary and kind of what you do for a living doesn't define your status. Well, in Poland, like when you're a developer, uh, you're like semi-god, like financially, <laughs> because you earn so much more money than everybody else. Uh, so it kind of um, defines you by status. And also like if you feel that way, it's natural that you want to, more and more uh, take more and more and more but the second reason might be that um right now the um, salary ranges are for majority of times like um disclosed mm-hmm. so you see how much um the other companies are offering and there is a race how much uh the other guy will offer and in germany it's still pretty like mm, not publicly available uh, for many companies, so I think, yeah, like, there is no need for this kind of race. Um, so this is one of the differences. Also, like, a lot of people warned me, like, do not write to developers via email, because, like, email is 999. Um, I don't know, like, I keep emailing people, I get positive responses, so... Uh, well, look... Uh, just they said the same thing about the phone and the German legislation is like if it scares most recruiters away then I'm happy for them to think that that's true then the rest of us is going to have an easier job when we actually email the developer and do it fairly personalized and mm. you know actually know who we're contacting so um, let them stay away from them yeah like <laughs> like that's uh, that's the bottom line for me I mean like as long as it's a uh, Mm, in agree with GDPR, as long as the email is at least a bit personalized, I mean, someone on the other side can see effort uh, that it's to them. It doesn't have to be like small stalking essay why I chose you. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, like if it's personalized and mm, you're gentle, like not like being pushy, be what uh then yeah then i think it's okay and if someone tells you like please don't write uh on my email yeah cool 
Yeah, absolutely. Like, then no you, problem. You, yeah, you stop doing that, you take them off the list and yeah. find somebody else. That's all. So, and I mean, obviously, having started from heavy on Boolean and uh, yeah, being able to, to, to use that a lot, uh, what does your tool stack look like today then? Uh, okay, so actually, like, I keep things very, very simple for two reasons. Like, um, I like simplicity. Um, second of all, like, as I told you before, like, I work in a four people company that scale like to the uh, eight people company when when I left yeah when I left I think that the company was eight people um, and now I'm working in a startup where basically like how much is spent on stuff uh, like people care about this kind of things and I'm like okay yeah I know that I could request a lot of fancy tools but I I can work without them like why would I like that that's not the moment. <laughs> Uh, so actually, yeah, right now, um, I use the LinkedIn, uh, recruiter light, not the, not the premium corporate enterprise version. Um, because yeah, like, um, it gives me the proper Boolean results, not like LinkedIn, not paid version. And yeah, it's like way more efficient than free LinkedIn, but I think that uh, simply the features you get with a enterprise version, uh, comparing to the price, it's just uh, not worth it. I mean, in, if you're in, in a case. 50 people recruitment team or 20 people recruitment team, then yes, th there is a lot of value in the statistics and uh, mm -hmm. you know the the light CRM functions, the mm -hmm. the yeah. things like that. But if you're the only sourcer and supporting one recruiter or two recruiters, you probably yeah. don't need to have all the bells and whistles and, and all of those filters, yeah. then yeah, it's, and if, if you like us, not going to use 150 in-mails every week, then yeah, you don't yeah. need the full version. Yeah, exactly. Like also like we don't need to hire like uh, 150 people this month or anything like this. And also like, uh, just to clarify, uh, this like I'm right now recruiter who does sourcing, and also we have <laughs> we have a uh, second recruiter who does only business, and I do engineering and related. Um, but yeah, basically, like maybe this is my background speaking, but yeah, so far I think that this is LinkedIn Enterprise Edition is slightly overpriced. Besides this, uh, from like the paid software, I use Gmailius, uh, mm -hmm. which is like um, a booster for your Gmail. Like it can uh, it can track your your emails. It can also uh, remind you on the follow ups. Also templates uh, makes it easier for you to insert gifts, which is surprising. <laughs> which comes surprisingly in handy. You. Um, and yeah, and it's really like cheap, like for yearly subscription, I paid like 50 bucks or something like this. So, um, and I get all the basic features. Uh, I was thinking about Lamblist, but I thought like, yeah, I, I tried the trial version and I don't understand the, <laughs> the product. Like, I, I don't know, maybe I, I was too fake for this. Uh, I mean, but maybe it's again, it's like if you don't have the kind of numbers where it's like you don't, you don't need five candidates a week or you don't, you don't have big follow-up campaigns or you, know, you don't have a thousand people that you, you want to keep warm or you want to keep up with or mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. all you, like, you know, like a lot of the things that I do where you're working in different time zones with different countries because mm -hmm. of the companies that you work with where that having scheduled email sending from a time zone point of view makes sense mm -hmm. yeah. um, and following up where if I had to do that in my, in my Gmail, that's just going to mess up a lot of things. So that, I mean, that's the cases where I use it. Uh, plus videos, just, it makes it easier to insert. Oh. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I, I've done tech hiring at volume with mm -hmm. only having, you know, an outlook and I had to manually schedule everything <laughs> and the follow-ups and that, that just took too much time. It's, you know, mm -hmm. like when you have to send whatever, 500 emails in a, in a month uh, mm -hmm. and you want to follow up with those that hasn't mm -hmm. responded, just, you know, who's responded to me, who set up an interview, who do, whom I'm still mm -hmm. missing. And like, yeah. I want to follow up five days later, but having to schedule that manually just was a, a nightmare for me.
Yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe this again, like the scale and the yeah. uh, background, <laughs> background thinking. Um, and yeah, and it's basically all the paid tools I use. Uh, besides this, there are like small twitches that uh, helps you with uh, improving like really small things like auto pagerizer, mm -hmm. which is like super small extension that basically you don't have to click page two, page three on your Google, but it just show you like a one pager, which is brilliant. <laughs> and I like discovered it at the end of last year and I was like where it was all my life. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, but it doesn't work only on Google, for example, on GitHub and stuff mm -hmm. like this. Uh, beside that, I use like uh, instant data scrapper when I when I need to scrap some um, uh, some GitHub results. That, that's my use case. Uh, also, I use some bookmarklets from Andre Bradshaw, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, just to actually just to scrap the, for example, LinkedIn recruit projects or search results, and for example, send it to send it to someone to actually see like the progress without the need of like yeah where you are in the project and, yeah, and share that you... kind of long list and things like that yeah yeah exactly like with enterprise uh, LinkedIn, you would have this but... <laughs> well <laughs> not completely you can still only do 25 at a time or you could last i had it which just mm -hmm. made it makes it annoying so you end up yeah. doing the same thing anyway like i'd rather send you the whole project than eight emails with 25 candidates at a time it's like no it's just here's the list of yeah. we're contacting for your role uh yeah but for example like if you're hiring manager is just curious to look at the people um you've searched it's like super quick to, to scrap this just give the linkedin urls and and send it to him uh, uh, or her and yeah and just and just be done with it within like a second. It's like super simple JavaScript script. So, uh, so yeah. And from the like the helpful tools that I would recommend, yeah, a free amazing hiring extension is really cool. Um, and yeah, beside this, ah, multi highlighter. <laughs> uh, this is also um, this is also quite nice. Uh, and yeah, and back in the days when I didn't felt so comfortable with like working in a tech environment or when I started to recruiting for a different technology that I didn't know so well, I used Glossary Tech mm -hmm. and just, uh, um, or is it Glossary Tech or? Yeah. Ah, yeah. Okay. Uh, just to um, like. Understand the different concept um, then. Yeah. Yeah, understand this my like super portable and comfortable dictionary. So mm -hmm. this was like really nice. And I think those are the the most important and yeah. And possibly maybe bulk opener, but this is like super small improvement. <laughs> uh that you basically like for example when I scrub the mm, the GitHub accounts. Uh, I have the URLs, but probably I'd like to check them on LinkedIn. How do they look like? Because not you won't find everything on GitHub, uh, and it's good to just cross-check. Um, and then I just bulk open, like for example, twenty GitHub profiles, and go one by one to double check and just cross irrelevant profiles. So, like, okay. yeah, small thing, but it's actually a nice touch, and it's also. Uh, Kind of cool when you open 20 top at once and your Chrome goes nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're on a Mac, your computer yeah. goes nuts as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on the Macs, Mac, so yeah. <laughs> I, I've been in one company where they gave me a Mac and I had it with me every time I was in the office. And when I wasn't, it was next to me, never open. Because I... I <laughs> One, a couple of things, like one, Chrome goes too slow, and two, uh, copy-paste is too close together on a Mac, so my fingers would hurt at the end of the day. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. So I was like, yeah, um, and I was like, no, nah, don't give me a Mac. It's like, I'll, I'll rather, I'll bring my own laptop, no problem, or if you give me a Mac, I'll use it for whatever I have to use it for to get into company things, but not for yeah. real work. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's yeah. good for developers. I'm not a developer, so... <laughs> Yeah, I actually I switched to Mac a couple of <laughs> a couple of years ago. Yeah, because like in a previous company, uh, I was given a Mac and I was like cursing this, like what what the, how a mankind could create something <laughs> like this. But like after a couple of months of using this, I was like, 
I never want to go back to Windows. No, and that, it's the thing. It's like you get used. You know, it's it's yeah. all what you have. It's like my use case is just different. And like, yeah, I I spend way too much money on a decent laptop, but with Windows, I just I put more power in it. It's like I just don't like Macs, but I've never had a Mac like my yeah. own. So it's like, yeah. yeah good. Uh, look, coming back to uh, Poland. Um, I know Poland as the kind of country that, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago uh, was where we would get developers to come and work for companies in Denmark, in the UK and Ireland and things yeah. like that. I know now that's changed. Uh, but, you know, if uh, if you are like me and uh, you still think Poland is the kind of country where you can get them to relocate to random countries, um, what, you know, what should we think about? And, and if, if we ended up on a project where more and more companies are actually setting up offices in Poland, yeah. what do we have to think about when we, uh, we source for, for people in, uh, in the Polish market? Starting from the uh, relocation, like, um, I think it's more and more challenging simply, simply because like the, um, you know, like average salary of the developer all over Europe is pretty similar. Um, so like, um, Immigration just to um, earn more money, like for uh, engineers, simply simply doesn't make sense. Like, um, why then they can't consider change is simply for um, like the political situation, healthcare situation. Basically, if something is maybe not wrong in the country, but they don't like something about the country or they want like significant improvement in some aspect. Um, so basically like, for example, there is, I see a certain, certain trend, but I might be very wrong about this, that uh, right now, like Scandinavian countries, especially Norway, um, is like one place to be, uh, but like, um, apart from this, like, um, I really like, um, I think that's way too inv individual to like generalize it. Um, I mean, right, right now, like the situation is pretty fragile. So right now uh, during the <laughs> no, but nobody's but, leaving. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, like, um, right now, if you want to relocate people, you just have to be persistent uh, and try to engage as many people as possible. And um, my only advice would be to like create some kind of um, national EVP, mm -hmm. uh, not just not to promote, but for your sourcing or recruiting team to know what's like your country's EVP. Um, and when you're engaging with the candidates, you can, point some um, it in some bullet points like for example like if you're recruiting people from Poland you can say that hey do you know the German system is one of the best in Europe and how about Polish one no 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 don't ask this. <laughs> uh, don't don't ask this but yeah I think that this is something that uh, not to take credit for not my idea this is something that um, Ilya from smartly mm -hmm. um, told on one of the on one of his talks that they did it on smartly they created the uh, EVP for Finland mm -hmm. and it actually worked pretty well so I think that create TVP for your country do research on the other country and yeah maybe that's how you're gonna use your advantage mm -hmm. and setting up in Poland um, I know more and more companies are doing it mm -hmm. I remember some of the first companies that that I was working with doing setting up uh, office in, in Krakow, uh, you know, and more and more, but also like going to, they go into smaller and smaller cities. Mm -hmm. What do, what do we have to think about? Like what's, uh, if you don't speak Polish or is that an absolute necessity as a recruiter or a source or having to, uh, to recruit uh, Polish people for Polish jobs? Um, how do we best do it? Um, fortunately, like, uh, in IT, uh, like most of them speak English on a, uh, pretty good level. Um, so uh, if you want to use non-Polish recruiter for recruiting Polish people, you'll probably uh, able to pull that off. Uh, obviously, when, <laughs> uh, obviously, when you have a Polish recruiter, you use, you use this advantage. Um, 
and yeah and uh what should you think about like um first of all like do a proper research on technical landscape and the company landscape um because for example like uh in warsaw you have a lot of like big corporations a lot of uh like banking companies and this kind of things i mean like I'm not saying there are all corporations and just free lonely startups on the on the you know some on the edge of the suburbs, but um it's like yeah, like this is a dominant dominant part of the um, employer market, the uh, huge corporations and yeah, and also because of the size of the company, most likely they would uh speak java or dot net <laughs> or any other you know like um bigger enterprise language um, but of course there are also different startups but this is a small part in Krakow yes also there are like uh, a lot of enterprise a lot of enterprise companies but in the same time there are like many small software houses many startups many like um, product companies and yeah there might be uh, using slightly there might be slightly different technological landscape but what um so uh, consider what you want mm -hmm. and what the city will provide you uh but also still i think that there are like tech hub in poland that have um, have a pretty good potential for example like krakow and warsaw are pretty um pre exploited i don't know if that's a good word but there is already a lot and there is a huge like shortage of, mm -hmm. okay, I know that shortage of talent is a cliche, <laughs> but like, and there is a terrible one. Uh, but for example, like there are a lot of skilled engineers in, um, in Poznan uh, or in Wrocław, but most of the people know this uh, city by um, Breslau or, uh, or Łódź. Um, or there are basically cities that have a lot of good engineers and not so many, not so many companies. At least last time I checked. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I would, and also like the paychecks are slightly lower there because there's not so much of a competition and not such a big race. Um, and if I um, like to mention any specific um, tech hub that. Um, could be a good field to start your company. Please forgive me. <laughs> um, but this was just examples from the top of my head. And yeah, so consider a smaller city because it will have equally talented engineers um, and probably a little less competition because if you would start to uh, work, uh, if you would like to set up in your company in the major cities like Krakow, Warsaw, Gdańsk, or Actually, I don't know where Wrocław is on this line. I think that's <laughs> it's becoming bigger and bigger right now. But uh, Krakow, Warsaw, or Gdańsk, uh, either you offer really good salary or you have a life-changing product that like have enormous, like great mission that everyone can relate to and everyone just is dying to work there, you'll have a pretty hard time. Um, um, yeah, so do do a proper research and don't get fooled by a big city's uh, magnetism. <laughs> you uh, you've done well uh, in uh, well hackathons, so specifically the the amazing hiring hackathon that was in Berlin, I think, a couple oh, months ago. Um, what's your secret? Uh, what you know? How do you you know? Is it is it something you do for fun, or is it just um, did you did you find an edge on it? Uh, okay, so like I tried to. Uh, I started doing like hackathons to to win, uh, to <laughs> prove something I don't know to whom, uh, and I failed every single time. Um, and actually, the Berlin hackathon was like, yeah, whatever, let's just have fun. Uh, so yeah, ju just have fun attitude really pays off. Um, the real second big secret is. Don't be afraid to Google stuff. Like, <laughs> don't don't think for tools like, and also don't be afraid of using natural language. Just because Google have a lot of different operators, doesn't mean you have to use them. Like, really, quotation marks and natural language really works miracles. And also, like, 
what I learned over the hackathon that um, that like usually hackathon questions use very specific language and they probably mean something. <laughs> so starting by quotation, copy paste the phrase, quotation mark will get you further than you would think. So uh, yeah, those are those are my lessons from hackathons, but also like something that I don't know if it's t- it's a tip or just a self con- consolation for me for the uh, hackathons I lost <laughs> terribly. Um, but basically, I would say that hackathons are not verifying if you're a good sourcer. Hackathons are verifying if you kind of can think fast in uh, scenarios that you're not very familiar with. And basically identifying candidates, yes, like it's important in sourcing, but I think it's getting slightly too much attention that it should, I mean, like I see lack of balance between like how much attention do we put to like identifying candidates per se, then we focus a bit, okay, like we focus on like how to engage candidates and stuff like this. And I see like barely any speeches on how to work with business, how to work with your hiring managers. Like, of course there are some, but I think that how to talk with business is one of the most important uh, thing for sourcer, especially at some point of your career. And why are we not talking more about this? Like this, once again, this is just my uh, purely subjective opinion, but yeah, but just as I say, like hackathons only test you how quick on the spot can you figure out solution in a very different from your working environment. So if you lose, it doesn't mean you're a bad source. No, Mihal, if uh, people want to follow you uh, and see where, uh, yeah, where your musings and, and where your, your life takes you, how can they best do that? Uh, okay, so um, like for every career, LinkedIn. <laughs> and also a uh, couple of months ago, I started posting on a uh, regular basis, which I'm proud of. Uh, like recruiting slash sourcing memes, um, and you can find them on Twitter every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, and yeah, some of them is really good stuff. Uh, not everything is gold, absolutely not, but uh, I think, yeah, you can have a laugh from time to time. So, uh, so yeah, it's not what's new with me, but I think it's a pretty decent content. So. Perfect. Look, thank you very much. I look uh, forward to meeting you soon again. Yeah, you too. And thank you. Thank, thank you for talking to me. Thank you. Yeah. If you like this episode, please consider sharing it or any of the other episodes with a friend or a colleague who might be interested as well. And consider subscribing to the channel, which will help us meet more people um, and grow the community.